Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Triple N Media. I am Dr. Nick Nick, I'm a cardiologist from Houston, Texas. In this presentation, we are going to look at anticoagulation for left ventricular thrombus. What are the conditions where we find left ventricular thrombus? How do we diagnose left ventricular thrombus? And how long these patients need to be on anticoagulation? And we're going to look at particular situations like those who already have cardiomyopathies or those who are more prone for left ventricular thrombus or those who have already been taking anticoagulations or antiplatelet agents. So let us begin with the main feature presentation. Generally, you can detect left ventricular thrombus if it is well organized and uh, like a mass uh, by 2D echocardiography. However, if the patient's chest conditions are such that we can't get a very good image of the left ventricular cavity to identify a thrombus as we are seeing as we are seeing here, one of the things we can do would be to do a transesophageal echocardiography which may delineate the presence of a thrombus much better than transthoracic echocardiography. The ultimate would be either a CT with contrast or MRA or CMR, which will show the presence of a clot and also the characteristics of the blood clot, whether it's old or new, and that will help to identify. And in this way, we can do serial studies to see if there has been a change in the size of the left ventricular thrombus. Let's look at some of the conditions uh, that may prone someone to develop blood clots. The two most common causes are uh, an acute myocardial infarction, especially the anteroseptal myocardial infarction, resulting in a dyskinetic septum or the apex, which acts like a nidus for the formation of the thrombus. Or it could be in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy or even hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who may be prone for developing these blood clots. In addition to that, there may be a series of uh, coagulation problems that could account for the presence of blood clot in the left ventricular cavity, especially in patients with reduced ejection fraction. Here's a beautiful article that came out in circulation in 2022, September 15th. And this talks about the management of risk for patients with left ventricular thrombus. It's a beautiful consensus opinion or article which clearly explains everything we need to know about uh, what uh, we should do in the presence of a left ventricular thrombus detected on an echocardiogram or confirmed on a transesophageal echocardiography or CT or CMR. One million people develop a myocardial infarction each year in the United States. LV thrombus is most often seen in patients with anteroseptal myocardial infarction and it can range from 4 to 39 percent. That's a pretty wide range. What it tells us is that every time we have a patient with a big anterior or anteroseptal apical myocardial infarction, we should look at echocardiograms for the presence of uh, blood clot. It may not be in the initial stages, but a follow-up echocardiogram within a few weeks following the myocardial infarction should be done to detect the presence of left ventricular thrombus. If these patients have thrombus that is clearly delineated as in this uh, picture, uh, it becomes important for us to treat these patients with uh, anticoagulation, which we will address in this article. Then, if the echocardiography is questionable, a TEE or CT or MR, CMR can be done. By treating these patients with anticoagulation, we can greatly reduce major adverse cardiovascular events. Those patients who have left ventricular thrombus have a 22% increase in risk of embolization, which makes a lot of sense that we need to first diagnose the presence of left ventricular thrombus, and two, we need to know how we deal with these patients in various circumstances. Those who are already on atrial fibrillation, on anticoagulation, those with anterior myocardial infarction, and who are on antiplatelet agents, and those patients who have other conditions uh, for which they may be an anticoagulations to begin with. How do we deal with those patients? And all those things will be addressed here.
Okay. The American Heart Association, in that consensus article which I posted, uh, which I showed at the beginning, comes up with eight key clinical management questions we need to ask when we are dealing with a patient with left ventricular thrombus. So let, let us look at those eight, eight different scenarios. First of all, is echocardiography adequate for detection of suspected left thrombus? I think echocardiography is useful in finding out if there is a suspicion of a left ventricular thrombus, but it is not 100% diagnostic uh, uh, in terms of uh, saying whether this is clot or a mass or something else. So wh whenever we detect something, and in most majority of, in majority of these patients, uh, when their chest configuration is not uh, amenable to get good clear images, then certainly a CMR or a cardiac CT with contrast may be more superior to detecting the left ventricular thrombus. Same way, transesophageal echocardiography can be done if you want to avoid radiation. Then what about in the era of uh, dual antiplatelet agents for patients with acute coronary syndrome and PCI? Remember, the most common cause of left ventricular uh, thrombus is enteroseptal myocardial infarction. That means these are patients with uh, acute coronary syndrome, non STEMI or NSTEMI who are already on dual antiplatelet agents. So if they are on dual antiplatelet agents, do we add a third agent on top of that to prevent any embolization from the left ventricular thrombus? So that's something we'll address in this article. What about in those patients, uh, uh, we have identified a thrombus and they have been treated with anticoagulation and how long do we treat them? The general consensus is you treat them for three to six months. Then you do a follow-up echocardiography. If the echocardiography shows complete resolution of the thrombus, uh, then we may be able to stop the anticoagulation. But we need to consider other situations where if you have a dyskinetic area, it is always prone for developing thrombus. That's something we have to keep in mind and see whether we need to continue with the anticoagulation or at least do follow-up echocardiograms to see if there is recurrence of the left ventricular thrombus. What about patients with dilated cardiomyopathy, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? Should these patients be treated with anticoagulation to prevent uh, thrombus from a LV, embolization from a LV thrombus. Patients with dilated cardiomyopathy with reduced ejection fraction who have LV thrombus, is there a predilection? Can we stop the anticoagulation if the LV thrombus is resolved? This is a very big question. These patients already have dilated cardiomyopathy. They have reduced rejection fraction, reduced wall motion, or maybe dyskinetic segments. And okay, you treated them for three to six months. The clot has disappeared. Should you stop the anticoagulation or should you continue the anticoagulation? Again, the overall clinical picture has to be taken into consideration. If these patients are in atrial fibrillation, it makes sense to continue with anticoagulation nonetheless. Okay. The next question is, uh, uh, either we have a mass that is uh, kind of uh, on a, a pedunk, on, on a, like a stalk, or we have a layered thrombus. If there is a layered thrombus, is it less likely to embolize, and should we really need anticoagulation for these patients? DOAX, are there reasonable alternative to warfarin in preventing LV thrombus embolization or dissolve, helping to dissolve this one. What do we do with those patients who continue to show the thrombus despite being on anticoagulation for three, six, nine months after it was detected? Let us see what we can find out by the recommendations seen in this article. Here are the recommendations. If we are in doubt, I think we should do a TE or CMR or contrast CT to diagnose the presence and also look at the extent of the left ventricular thrombus. That is the first step. Establishing the diagnosis of left ventricular thrombus, the size, the location, the nature, then we can decide what we do to do next. 
Second, there is relatively weak data supporting prophylactic uh, oral anticoagulation for patients with enteroceptal STEMI following reperfusion therapy. So you, you, I don't think there's a reason to treat uh, all patients with STEMI, especially involving the enteroceptal area with anticoagulation. We need to look at the risk because these patients are already on two antiplatelet agents. To add a third one could be much risky in terms of excessive bleeding. We need to weigh the advantages versus the disadvantages and then decide clinically what is the most appropriate step we need to take. If we do detect left ventricular thrombus, here's the point number three. They say the typical duration of treatment with anticoagulation is three months. Sometimes it could be six months. Then we follow up with an echocardiogram. If the echocardiogram shows complete resolution of the left ventricular thrombus, then it says it's reasonable to stop the anticoagulation. If there's no indication for anticoagulation continuation from other causes like pulmonary embolus, atrial fibrillation, or dilated cardiomyopathy with poor left ventricular uh, ejection fraction. What about patients with dilated cardiomyopathy? The dilated cardiomyopathy should not by itself be an indication for oral anticoagulation therapy except if these patients have associated atrial fibrillation or if there is evidence of left ventricular thrombus detected by various uh, diagnostic tests we have talked about. Patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy with LV thrombus should be treated with anticoagulation for three to six months. So whether they have an ischemic event with dyskinetic segment or they have a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy with dyskinetic segment and a thrombus, they need to be treated identically. That is, they should be on anticoagulation for three to six months. There is no evidence to suggest these patients need to be on continuous uh, anticoagulation on a long-term basis. We are talking about laminar thrombus and here's the recommendation. They say these patients' uh, uh, limited data, it may be prudent to treat these patients with newly diagnosed mural or laminated LV thrombus as you would treat a patient with a mass or a, a pedunculated uh, thrombus. So in other words, whether you're seeing a mass thrombus or a laminated thrombus, best thing is to treat them for three months, repeat the study, and, and see if there has been any resolution of the thrombus. Again, there is insufficient data in patients with LV thrombus, uh, whether DOAX seem to be reasonable alternative to warfarin, or DOAX better than warfarin, because with warfarin, we have to measure the PT and INR, and again, there's going to be wide fluctuations in the PT INR, along with slightly increased risk of bleeding in patients who are on uh, uh, warfarin. It seems DOAX are reasonable to use in patients with uh, left ventricular thrombus in place of warfarin. There are situations where we have to consider continuation of anticoagulation in patients who are perpetually prone to develop left ventricular thrombus. That is, uh, patients uh, who have uh, a severely dilated cardiomyopathy patients with atrial fibrillation, history of pulmonary embolism, or patients with uh, dyskinetic segments. And all of these patients need to be on a long-term anticoagulation treatment. Factors that favor continued oral anticoagulation treatment. Patients with persistent akinesis, protruding or mobile thrombus, cardioembolic events in the past. The bleeding risk is fairly low, pro-inflammatory or hypercoagulable states. All this makes sense to continue anticoagulation on a long-term basis. Recurrent LV thrombus, that's what I was talking about. You do a repeat uh, diagnostic tests, be it uh, transthoracic echocardiography, CT, MRA, CMR, and if there is recurrence of thrombus or the thrombus doesn't seem to be disappearing, then we need to continue these patients on anticoagulation. High bleeding risk can accommodate antiplatelet therapy. That's something we need to keep in mind because patients with atrial fibrillation, with acute coronary syndrome, anterior myocardial infarction, dyskinetic septum and the apex, 
they are going to be on antiplatelet agents and anticoagulants in which case we may have to reduce the dose of the anticoagulation so that we reduce excessive bleeding persistent mural thrombus uh, if organized or calcified despite therapeutic oral anticoagulation therapy so these are the situations where we should consider the possibility of continuing anticoagulation on a long term basis so ladies and gentlemen you have been listening to a presentation on anticoagulation for left ventricular thrombus how do we diagnose left ventricular thrombus how do we define the characteristics of left ventricular thrombus which type of patients are prone for developing ventricular thrombus and how do we decide on treating these patients with uh, oral anticoagulant agents thank you so much for watching this has been a presentation of triple n media i am dr nick nick am a cardiologist and we have more than 300 presentations on cardiology topics please do watch them and please do subscribe to our youtube channel and i will see you in the next presentation